I am Lucy and Reese Roberts, and with my husband Stephen Harris, who's an architect, we designed the new club that you see here today. And it was really to keep as much as we could of the existing structures, a space where we could envision looking at art. And um, it was really with the help of Rod and Susan that this amazing collection of art came together. We really love coming here with our friends and it's really, I sense, uh, invigorated uh, the enjoyment people have for the club. I'd like to welcome you, uh, of course, on behalf of Tamarisk and the Programming Committee to this wonderful evening. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what this is. Um, in the beginning of the year, we knew that we had uh, we have many accomplished and interesting and wonderful members here, and we thought, why don't we feature them on our speaker nights and get to know them better? And so lo and behold, we knew that Rod and Susan were art collectors, but we had no idea where we had this. And they came up with this wonderful idea for the club and a wonderful concept, which I have never heard of, uh, and I'll tell you about it, but it was a win-win for us, for the artists, and for our community. So it is really an honor for me to welcome them, but I do want to thank you, thank my committee, who worked very hard on, on all these concepts, Marilyn Malkin, Don Flood, Lillian Zissick, uh, and all the effort that they put forth in putting programs together, most of which we had to cancel this year. Um, but hope that this is the beginning of, of lots of good, good evenings and good events. And we thank you so much for supporting this program. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Lebesniks before they begin. Susan and Rod are passionate collectors of contemporary art and longtime supporters of the performing and visual arts. Their global, globally sourced art collection spans nearly three decades of acquisitions. Their commitment to art includes opening their home and loaning works to museums. They are currently renovating a home on the golf course, and I hope they have time for us again. Susan is a retired industry leader in internet and strategic marketing with MBA from Northwestern, and she currently serves, on, has served seven years as a trustee of the Palm Strings Art Museum, where she was vice chair, served on the executive committee, chaired the Advancement Committee, and co-chaired the Board's uh, divers Diversity Committee. She currently serves on the Exhibitions Committee of the MCA Chicago and is a trustee of HDTS in Joshua Tree, which is also a new program in the area. Rod is the Vice President of the Tamaris Board of Directors, a veteran of community planning synagogues for profit and nonprofit boards, he currently serves on the board of the Arts Club of Chicago, the Collections Committee of the Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago, and the board and executive committee of the Michigan City, Indiana-based Lubeznik Center of the Arts. Rod is the CEO of RMC Enterprises, LLC, which owns and operates McDonald's restaurants in Chicago and in Northwest Indiana. Quite impressive, and I welcome both, and I thank you so much. They worked tirelessly on putting this together. Thank you. The only thing Margot didn't tell you is that I uh, weighed seven pounds, eight ounces at birth. <laughs> Margot, in all seriousness, thank you for the gracious uh, introduction. Um, it's just astounding to see so many uh, people here this evening, and uh, we uh, are excited that you're here and excited to uh, start the program. This program, 24 months ago, um, could not have even been imagined. Uh, it was the beginning of the pandemic, marked with uncertainty about all aspects of our lives. It was then that our past president, Michael Scobie, who is here with us, asked uh, a fellow member, Bill Kaplan, to assemble a long-range planning committee to study the state of the club and to make recommendations for our future. The committee benchmarked other clubs and studied industry best practices. 
One of the recommendations of Bill's committee was to rethink the dining areas of the club, to add a bar, and to consider a grill room, which would allow the club more flexibility operationally and to provide our members with more dining options. The board accepted this recommendation, and two members stepped forward to offer their design expertise. Those members are award-winning architect Stephen Harris, and Interior Design Hall of Fame designer, Lucian Reese Roberts. <laughs> Lucian is here with us this, this evening. The result, as you can see, is a beautifully designed, unique, and intimate space, which we all now get to enjoy. This isn't really that long. I'll be done shortly. Contemporary art has enhanced and enlivened numerous clubs and organizations throughout the world. The Arts Club of Chicago and the Arts Club of London, as well as Soho Houses internationally, are a few examples. This was actually my vision for Tamarisk as well, but as construction progressed, I realized that because of unexpected pandemic-related expenses, we would have no money for artwork. We considered that a problem that needed to be solved. And so I asked Susan, and the two of us started brainstorming various ideas as to how to deal with that. We were very motivated to find a way to complement Stephen and Lucian's masterful design and to have contemporary art become a part of the Tamarisk brand. The Art of Tamarisk program was conceived, and with the unanimous consent and enthusiastic support of the Tamarisk Board of Directors, we are here tonight to celebrate the inaugural art installation. I'd like to um, ask uh, my uh, wife and partner in crime, Susan, to talk to you about the Art of Tamarisk program and to introduce our guests. Susan? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rob, thank you, and uh, Margo, thank you also for your support. Really uh, was really, really uh, critical um, to us as we were planning this program and trying to plan the other programs that have been a little limited due to COVID. This has been a really fun and very satisfying project. Rod and I always love to install art in our home. We rotate every year or so. We have a great time. Every time we do it, we think it's perfect. Um, then the next time we do it and we realize it's more perfect, at least you know for us, it's really fun. And, and now all of you will get to enjoy the same um, um, uh, nervousness, anxiety about are we going to like it as much, um, and the conversation around what you do and don't love uh, as, as we do. So when Rod brought up, this, um, brought up this project, we were trying to figure out how are we going to get art on the walls that was high quality art of the caliber of Lucian and Stevens' design, and how are we going to do it with no budget? And so <laughs> that was a bit of a challenge. So we talked to friends, we talked to collector friends, we talked to artist friends, curators, and uh, bounced off a bunch of ideas. And we got really strong support for an idea that turned into this, which was borrowing art, and borrowing art together for a year, hanging it on our walls, and um, bringing all of you into that experience of meeting the artists and hearing, hearing all about them. So what we decided was that we would have a rotating annual program with uh, critically recognized contemporary artists. And these artists are hang in homes and museums in the desert, in the US, and uh, many around the world. And so we decided to start identifying a list of artists. And Rod and I were very busy making our list of artists. And then we realized, wait, 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 wait. This is not the Rod and Susan show we would like to have a professional curator to complement the professionalism of the design designer, the architect, and the quality of art we're talking about. And we thought about, we know a lot of different curators, but we decided to reach out to Brooke Hodge, 
who I'll introduce in a moment, who's over here. And, um, and Brooke agreed to be the first inaugural curator for this, uh, for this project. Um, there are some key elements to the program, which are on the printout some of you have, and if you don't have, we'll get you other copies, or it can be emailed to you. The key elements of the program are, first of all, it's, as I said, an annual program. And when you come back in November, there will be new art on the walls. And if you're in love with this art, you can buy it. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so every year, there'll be a new installation. And the curator selects the artwork. It's not me or Rod. We've had some of you come with um, really great recommendations for artists. Um, and we're passing those on to the next curator, who we haven't named yet. And, um, and that person will select the artwork. So it's not the Rod and Susan show. The work that, is, that you see, and for every program every year, will be borrowed from the artists and loaned to the club for our use for one year. The next point is that the art, as I said, is for sale. And the reason it's for sale is these artists have given us work from their inventory. And they, they make art, they love to make art, but they make art for a living. And so in exchange for them parting with the work but not getting paid for it for a year, we said, okay, fine, we'll sell the work. But we don't have any transactions going through the club. No money passes through the club. The club doesn't take a percentage. There's no commissions. All the transactions are handled from the member directly with the artist, and we will put you in touch with the artist so that you can make your own um, arrangements. The price lists are also available on the credenza and out um, on the reception desk, and we're happy to talk to you. So there are a few works that are already sold, and some people have inquired about works tonight, so um, uh, we'll get those updated um, as, as soon as possible. Uh, lastly, the Artists are available for studio visits. Some of you have already gone this season to visit artists. Some, uh, someone has gone uh, to Sarah's studio, for example, and wanted to buy these three works, but they're too big for her house, and so she commissioned Sarah to do a similar arrangement, but a little bit smaller to fit in her house. So the artists are all available for studio visits, and uh, at the club, we're talking about whether we could or still arrange a few group studio visits. If you're interested in studio visits, please let Karen Couch know, and we'll, uh, we'll gauge, the, um, gauge the interest. We have six of the artists are here tonight, six of the eight artists. I'm going to ask them to just uh, raise their hand. Sarah Gen, that's her work here. <laughs> and Harrison Fraley. Harrison is over here, and these are his paintings flanking the fireplace. Um, Philip K. Smith, whose work is this, and you'll see another one. Uh, Don Flood, who not only curated the uh, photos in the grill room, but also is responsible for the wallpaper. You'll hear more about that. Um, and by the way, the photos in the grill room are not part of Art at Tamarisk. They are a permanent part of the club, just like that gorgeous tapestry. So you don't have to part with those photos. Uh, when you come back in November, they'll still, they'll still be there. Uh, in addition, we have John Davola here. John is in the back, but you'll meet him. Uh, John's work are the running dogs, and you'll see, you'll see those shortly. And then last but not least, we have Jim Isserman here. Where is Jim? And Jim Isserman um, is the painter of the uh, red, white, and blue paintings that are in the main dining room. I also like to welcome Liz Armstrong. Where's Liz? Somewhere. Liz Armstrong is in the back waving. Uh, Liz Armstrong is a former dire executive director of the Palm Springs Art Museum, and it's exciting to have her here as well. She'll tell Rod and I later how we and Brooke did with our first uh, work. So let me now introduce Brooke, and Brooke will say a few words, and then we're going to go artist by uh, artist. By artist. So uh, Brooke Hodge, I have her bio right here. 
Thank you. Okay, so Brooke Hodge. Um, Brooke Hodge, as we said, is the inaugural Art at Tamarisk guest curator. She served as director of architecture and design at the Palm Springs Art Museum from 2016 through 2020. And she's held positions at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York, at the Hammer in LA, at the Museum of Contemporary Art, MOCA in LA, and Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Just a few uh, positions that have added to her great expertise. Brooke's curatorial projects have focused on art, design, architecture, and fashion, and she has written extensively about these subjects for the New York Times Tea Magazine, Wallpaper, Palm Springs Life, and the LA Times Magazine, among others. Please welcome Brooke Hodge. And before I begin, I'd, li I'd like to thank Susan and Rod and the board of Tamara's Country Club for providing this amazing opportunity to create the first Art at Tamarisk program. It was really exciting and really re rewarding, and I'm very happy that you'll get to meet many of the artists tonight. This is a wonderful time to be in Southern California. I moved here in 2016 from New York to take a job at Palm Springs Art Museum, and when I moved to, Palm when I moved to New York in 2014, I thought, why did I leave California? There's so much going on here. The art world was making a big shift to Southern California, to LA, and we have so many amazing artists out here in this area. And so when I, Susan and Rod invited me to curate this first Art at Tamarisk program, it was an opportunity to show the work of some of the many artists that we have in this area. And I chose artists, um, for a variety of reasons. I wanted to have men and women, artists at different stages in their career, from emerging to much more established, and artists who work in different mediums, painting, sculpture, photography, fiber work. Um, and so we were able to do that, and the artists were great to work with. Everybody immediately accepted the invitation to be part of the program and were very enthusiastic in letting us select, you know, the work that you see here tonight. And so we have, the artists are from Riverside to Palm Springs, Palm Desert, and the High Desert. And the other important thing about this program is that we have a wonderful museum in Palm Springs, but we don't have that many art galleries in the area, in the valley. And so this provided a new platform, not only for me as a curator to put together an art installation, but also for the artists to show their work and for people to see their work. And that was a really important thing to us in creating this program. I was really fortunate to be able to work in this beautiful space. I knew of Lucien Reese Roberts and Stephen Harris's work and um, when I came to the clubhouse for the first time with Susan and Rod, I was just overwhelmed because it was just so beautiful. I hadn't seen it before, but I heard a lot about all of the changes that were made. And I knew that Lucien and Stephen wanted to create spaces that were more kind of residential in feeling and um, great walls for hanging art, beautiful light, especially in this room and in the main dining room and then the beautiful intimate space of the private dining room, um, which we're not gonna go into tonight, but I encourage you to visit next time you're here at the club, and also the new bar area, where we have work by Amy Kim Keeler on display. So if we're not pointing out those works directly tonight, please be sure to take a look at them um, when you're here the next time. So I think that is the end of my opening remarks, and I'm gonna hand the microphone back to Susan so that she can introduce the first artist who's gonna to speak to us tonight. Great, thank you, Brooke. So this is Sarah again, who is also one of my uh, pickleball partners. And <laughs> I first met Sarah when uh, we, Rod and I were introduced by the, uh, a previous director of the Palm Springs Art Museum and we went for a studio visit, and then I went to a board meeting at the museum, and in the boardroom were these three gorgeous paintings, the one that's in the main dining room, and a fifth one. 
and they were part of an installation that was commissioned for, uh, for the boardroom um, for that time. During the pandemic, the museum, as you know, was closed. Nobody got to see these paintings, and so when we started working on this project, we thought, okay, wonder if Sarah would be able to get those paintings out of the museum, since the museum hadn't bought them, and bring them over here, and so, and here we are. So, um, Sarah, I'll let, um, let you talk about your work, but I'll just quickly say, Sarah's a Canadian-born artist. She lives and works in Palm Springs. She got her BFA from Queen's University in Kingston, Canada, and her work has been shown widely in solo and group exhibitions, and, as in, and is in private collections in North America, Asia, Australia, and Europe, including the Palm Springs Art Museum, in addition to this group that I just talked about. Uh, the works you see at the club, I already explained that. Um, Sarah is represented by Morgan Lehman Gallery in New York, Gallery Jones in Vancouver, and as she will explain, her work is driven by the core principles of asymmetry, simplicity, austerity, and intimacy. Sarah again. Thanks for having me. And I will um, echo Brooke's words and say thank you to both of you and to all of you for, for having all of the artists here in your stunning new space. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to bring our expression to such a serene and beautiful, thoughtfully designed environment. Um, my work in particular is um, created to be always in dialogue with light, both natural and artificial conditions. And when I first came in to see this space, when it was, was finished, um, I was really immediately blown away by this um, perpendicular, soft, ambient light coming into this room and thought it was um, a dream environment for large, immersive color fields. I was born in Canada to a Canadian landscape painter. My father taught me the principles of design and uh, appreciation of organic forms and how to find forms in nature and draw inspiration from um, colors in nature and how to redesign. And so while I didn't follow in his footsteps and become a Canadian landscape painter, I um, brought a practice of plein air work that is painting in the outdoor environment to my practice as a color field painter. So I, after I finished school in Vancouver, I went to New York City and worked and painted there for 14 years. And in 2018, my husband and I um, bought a house in, in Palm Springs. And <laughs> we could hardly believe the relative, relevatory experience of suddenly moving to Southern California from Tribeca. <laughs> We were living in a bowling alley style loft where there's light on either end and it's very dark in the middle. And for those of you who know what it's like to be in New York, it's a place of artificial conditions. The conditions are the polar opposite to working in this environment where we're in constant contact and confrontation of the natural world and its proximity to us is so uh, immediate. Um, the conditions of the day are changing from warm to cool from the moment we wake up to the moment we, we go to sleep. So for my work, it was, um, it was quite a progression or evolution to suddenly work in a low-slung mid-century house with no overhead lighting and to deal with the conditions of natural light and to stop working when the sun finally went behind the, the mountain or as I call it, the Purple Curtain, which is the San Jacinto mountain range, and suddenly lose the light. I think, I thought my eyesight was improving for a moment because things were so articulated and clear. It's been incredibly inspiring to work here. <clears throat> so this, this work is um, a sort of a direct um, response to that. The, the series is called New Alphabet. It's not meant to... Um, mimic directly typography, but it is a new language of seeing and a, a palette of the nature of, of Southern California, the colors of Southern California, and maybe even like a new language for me in, in my practice to have changed locations and to um, know where I am through the conditions of my house where I work 
and the places that my paintings can go from here. And um, just try to share that revelation and joy that has been the, the great experience of coming here just such a short time ago. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Sarah. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you Harrison Fraley. Harrison is the artist of these two paintings, Flanking the Fireplace. He lives and works in Yucca Valley, up in the high desert. And he studied art at Savannah College of Art and Design. And from there, he moved to New York, where he really began his art practice while he was doing a number of other jobs to support himself. And in 2015, he moved back to California. He's a California native. He grew, grew up in Studio City. And he established his studio up in Yucca Valley and created these beautiful works. So I'm going to hand the microphone over to Harrison, and he's going to tell us a little bit about his practice and his creative process. Thank you, Brooke. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank Rod and Susan and Brooke and everyone involved. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in painting um, uh, through the material. I, I use a purified beeswax, and essentially, <clears throat> uh, the work can lend to more work, to more work, to more work. And essentially, uh, I have a material that I could continually reassess a painting, um, expanding time in a way where material is up front, I can remove it, and that draws. So basically, um, uh, my paintings are my life in a sense, which are much more complicated than paintings. But um, these are two great examples of recent work um, that I'm working on now. And uh, they're 10 foot paintings that have to do with work. So doing would be the way to really access knowledge instead of knowledge um, being uh, part of my work. Uh, it's about work. I've introduced uh, heavier uh, machines and uh, different tools to scrape and to draw. Um, uh, I use the, uh, the advantage of having photography uh, is become a miracle because it is time, and I'm able to expand and compress time simultaneously. And what I mean by that is um, I could paint on a painting for years, um, and I could also make work simultaneously, like this painting, um, at the same time. This painting would be exhausted um, and reduced to uh, a melted surface that has everything just run right off of it, which to me was successful. Um, this one over here would be more additive in creating blocks of color and drawing, um, removing, drawing, and removing. And um, essentially, uh, there's a lot of work to do. I, uh, I'm very uh, pleased to have these new paintings up in uh, this beautiful space. And if you guys have any questions. So what I was interested in painting was like, immediately was this like, kind of danger, this rhythm that I could make with hot wax and this kind of um, presence that was this realness to it. Um, where I could actually, I have paint that actually dries in about 12 seconds for as long as wax takes to heal. Um, I can add oil paint directly in that and into the wax, yes. And uh, thank you, Brooke. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's the forgiveness of it, you know, I can remove it and that will draw. So essentially I have just a really uh, intense 15-year project that has, I've barely crossed the surface. And most of you might know that if an artist is working with oil paint, it takes a really long time to dry. But because of Harris's process of putting pigment directly into pots full of melted beeswax and then applying that in various ways like mostly gesturally sort of thrown across the canvas the paint and the wax actually dry really fast which enable him to then continue working on the surface it kind of has a, a a speed to it that i'm able to change things very quickly and react to them so i'm constantly reacting um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of discovery 
The discovery is a really important part of the process because when Harrison starts out, he doesn't really have an end result in mind. He doesn't know, for example, that this painting is going to look like this or that painting is going to look like that. But it's all part of his process of working on the surface of the painting and excavating parts of it in a way and revealing things that he's obscured or hidden in the early parts of the process. Yeah, and it's like my life. I can see, I can find a receipt in there. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I'm able to uh, manufacture tools with the, um, and uh, steel supports that go on the back of the painting so I can really wail on them. Um, uh, I have introduced boulders into my work with a crane, <laughs> and I've been bouncing boulders off of uh, some surfaces. But let me take a question over here. The question was about the observation that there is a lot of to the work and that as you will have maybe read in the bio of Harrison that's available, he did work with the artist Julian Schnabel in New York and the question about how that might have influenced his work, not influenced his work. Well, well sure, when you go to the, right, the plates, um, I've broken a lot of them. Um, when you see, uh, you know, a, an artist access that kind of freedom in a space designed and for that, um, it's, it's pretty inspiring, to say the least. Um, and also the reality of, you know, wearing gloves and touching stuff. Um, you learn how to move things that are big. So I'm very interested in making big work, um, to say the least. Go, go, go ahead. Sure. You know, you know that you know what he did. The question was, was he influenced by Jackson Pollock? Right. He put it on the on the ground. These these panels can go face up and then go back up. And that's tremendous, you know. Um, he really he really did that. <laughs> you know, that's the big deal, you know. So um, of course I can't make a a mark that is, uh, that, you know, these drips and stuff to allow that, you have, it has to be on the wall. So um, I think I'm running out of time here. Go ahead. <laughs> Usually I just tell him, stop working on it. <laughs> I have the police that pull me off of the work. No, I, to begin is what I get kind of worried about um, because there's not a lot of history, you know, reacting to the history. So I essentially you use photography to begin and um, it's joyous, I mean, to really pick out a picture and then to cover it um, and then constantly react to that would be a means to work. We have another painting of Harrison's in the, in the main dining room. So I think we're gonna move in there, but I just also wanted to say thank you to David Knaus, who's here with us tonight. Thank Can you, you David. raise your hand, David? He's, he has generously lent that painting to the installation and we'll be happy to take your question once we're in the, in the main dining room. Um, Harrison, thank you so much. Uh, Rod and I have witnessed Harrison talking about a work in his studio and Brooke and Her him saying, I, I don't think it's quite done, and Brooke saying, it's done, it's done, it's great. And then it, sometimes it is and sometimes it's not because he's obviously the artist. Okay, next uh, we have Philip K. Smith, and um, Philip is going to come and talk about his practice. He's going to talk about this work, and then he'll also talk about the work that um, lights up, that is the newest one that was installed in the other room, and that uh, is called a flat um, torus. Phil, where are you? Right here. Okay, great. Uh, Philip K. Smith III, uh, affectionately known as PKS3, uh, lives and works in Palm Desert, and he grew up in the valley. Phil uses light as a medium, and he'll tell you more about how that all works for him. Phil trained as an artist as and as an architect at RISD, Rhode Island School of Design. His recent projects, and you may have seen uh, many of these, uh, you may have seen Phil's work at uh, Desert X, the opening year of Desert X. He also had a project um, um, commissioned by the Fashion House Cos, one of my favorite brands, COS, for the Salon, uh, Salone de Mobile in Milan, Italy. Uh, there's a phenomenal work of his in Detroit. Does anyone live in Detroit? All right, so fabulous work in Detroit that is uh, it's called the Sky Bridge. 
uh, where Phil will tell you when he speaks, he'll explain. It's a phenomenal outdoor installation. It's only 100 feet long, and, um, and it lights up at night. You'll, you'll hear about it. Uh, Phil also uh, did the work called Three Half Lozenges, which is a permanent acquisition activating the facade of the new Newark Museum of Art. His work is in the collection of numerous museums, including the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Denver Art Museum, and of course, Palm Springs Art Museum. Smith is currently working on several new public projects, including Parallel Perpendicular for the new West Hollywood Park and Four Corners, uh, and another project called Four Corners Extruded for the Seattle Sound Transit. So his work is uh, also in, in many collections. A number of people in this room have Phil's work. Uh, in there, and um, and we're thrilled to have you here and your work. Please go ahead and speak. And you'll hear more from Phil in the next room. Thank you very much, uh, Susan and Rod, and uh, and for all of you here tonight coming out to uh, hear us artists talk about our work. Um, it's an exciting opportunity, and uh, I'm very honored to be part of this program. And Lucien and Stephen, thank you for designing such a beautiful space uh, and to be, to be able to be part of it is, uh, is exciting and, and an honor. Um, I, I am a rare bird in that I actually grew up here in the desert. Um, and, uh, but it was at the end of high school that I left and went to RISD and studied architecture and art and had an 11 year stint on the East Coast. Um, and there was a moment in 2000 when uh, I decided to come back to the desert uh, I'm going to be honest, I thought I'd be here for maybe three months max. It's been 22 years. I wouldn't live anywhere else. And I think really what, what happened in that moment was uh, uh, when I was in Boston, this, this feeling after not having seen the sun in 10 days that I uh, sort of felt like the, the desert was part of my core, part of my soul of who I am. And coming back to the desert was in a way a kind of great re reawakening of the beauty that exists here and probably a lot of the reason why a lot of you have chosen to move here or have a second home here. Um, and so uh, this piece behind me, uh, uh, Fasted Disc variant number seven, is part of really my original works that are called the Light and Shadow series that ultimately are highly inspired by the little San Bernardino Mountains that separate our lower desert from Joshua Tree National Park, all of these mountains to the north that we see transform over the course of a day from a monochromatic silhouette to a highly textured three-dimensional surface. And all of that really just activated by the movement of the sun moving from the east to the west. So uh, in these works, uh, these all white uh, uh, fiberglass works with these kind of pure surfaces, I'm really just trying to present that light in its simplest state across this folded modulated surface. The faceted discs, I'll say, are, uh, are part of an ongoing series. I'm actually committing to build 100 unique discs. Uh, those are a bit smaller. Those are about 30 inches in diameter. All of them would be the same 30-inch uh, dimension. They'd all be the same low sheen white. Um, and, but each of them sort of a, a, a different take, a different uh, attitude about how that light can be presented. Um, I'll just speak briefly to you about uh, the piece in the other room. You're sort of seeing uh, the two halves of my brain here. You're seeing uh, light that is activated uh, by the sun and by uh, artificial lighting at night. And then also in the other room is this work that is activated through changing color, through LED color. Uh, that piece is called Flat Taurus. Um, it's variant number four. Uh, and it's an entirely flat surface. A torus is essentially a geometric term for a donut, which is sort of where this whole series began. Um, and what I'm trying to do is to create different spatial conditions as a result of the adjacencies and shifts of color. So if you really spend time in that room, maybe you want to be the person that takes a chair and sits in front of that piece tonight. Uh, you can really spend time with the work, and when you spend time with it, the pace of your experience begins to align with the pace of the work. And uh, uh, when you begin to align, you begin to really see for the first time. And you really then start to see the colors and the shift and the kind of spatial conditions that exist 
within that work. Um, I get asked a lot about materiality. Uh, as I mentioned, this is fiberglass, it's a fiberglass composite, but I would say this piece is made of light and shadow. The other piece is a white translucent acrylic, but I would say that it is assembled from bars and bands of color. So, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this and for coming tonight. How do you conceive of, the, of how the angles are created and yeah. the size and so forth? Yeah. Could you talk about that? Please? It's a great question. Uh, every single piece that I have ever made starts through drawing. Uh, even as a very young child, uh, my parents always said I was a great kid because they could give me a piece of paper and a pencil and I'd be quiet for hours. Uh, and that's true to this day. Um, so I, I, I really think through drawing. So first, I work through drawing. And then I would argue that light requires intense precision. If there's any aberration in that surface, we're all looking at it. And we're all wondering if that's purposeful. So the, ultimately, the drawings then find their ways into models, into studies, and then into the computer, where ultimately we make a very precise uh, three-dimensional model. And that model is, is actually computer milled out of a negative form and then laid up with fiberglass, hand-finished, hand-painted. And what's amazing about that logic is that there's essentially zero tolerance from what I want it to be and what it will be, which is kind of a crazy thing to say, but is the reality of this process. So, yes. Okay, Detroit. The project, what, what about the project in Detroit? Um, I was commissioned back in 2017 um, by a client, actually the Gilberts, uh, that own Quicken Loans, and, 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 and also um, Library Street Collective. Uh, I, I, I got a call one day saying, we've been following your work and we think we have a site that might be appropriate for your work. And they sent me photos of a 100 foot long sky bridge spanning between two skyscrapers on the 16th floor in downtown Detroit that was unused, had been unused for 25 years. And so it was my thought to take every window and turn it into a controllable pixel of light so that during the day it's its normal historic self, but in the evening at sunset, the lights emerge and begin to push and move and shift across that surface deep into the evening where it appears that even color is cantilevering out from the skyscrapers. You're always looking up at it. You're in the middle of downtown, surrounded by the kind of frenzy of urbanity, but then you're looking up to the skies and the top of the skyscrapers and then seeing this work uh, sort of as part of the architecture, but also at the pace of the environment. So, Yes, it's uh, One Woodward, which is the white building on the left side, left side and the Guardian building, very famous building for, uh, for Detroit. Great. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, everybody. Phil. I also, um, I, we, I forgot, I also wanted to introduce uh, Lisa Vossler-Smith, who is here somewhere. Yes, right there. There she is. Lisa um, is, happens to be married to Phil, but um, uh, the other part of what she does is she's the executive director of Modernism Week. And so um, many of you enjoyed that this year. And feel free to talk to, uh, to Lisa about Modernism Week during the evening, if you'd like. Uh, okay, Brooke. We're going to shift our focus this way. Dawn is one of the most accomplished photographers of beauty, celebrity, and fashion. Working today, and his photographs have appeared in the pages of many of the magazines that we read. Vanity Fair, Esquire, Elle, Mary Claire... In style, just to name a few. And he also shoots beauty and fashion for clients such as Pantene, CoverGirl, Victoria's Secret, Clairol, L'Oreal, etc. And he's also done a number of celebrity portraits, including those of Jennifer Lawrence, Diane Lane, Naomi Watts, Eva Mendez, Jessica Beale, and many famous musicians as well. Don um, put his talent at photography to great use when he founded Flypaper, which is a company that he created so that he could design wallpaper using his photographs. And we knew 
that um, Lucian and Stephen would want to include some of Don's amazing wallpaper, and he created a bespoke wallpaper just for this project at Tamarisk. So because this area where the wallpaper is is small, Don's going to talk to you from here about his work. And he, as you also know, probably he curated masterfully the installation of the photographs in the grill room. And um, I was here when he was installing everything, and it was really amazing to see that all come together. So we're going to, Don's going to talk here, and then we're going to move through the space into the grill room, and then Susan's going to introduce John Devola. Don. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm honored to be here uh, amongst these uh, amazing artists. Um, uh, Flypaper, it wasn't really something that I intended to do. It was, I have a very um, difficult, not difficult, but picky daughter who wanted wallpaper for her room and we couldn't figure out what to do. So I, um, after searching for wallpaper, I actually found wallpaper stock that would go through my Epson printer and did a still life of a rose and made wallpaper and installed it in a room and then became a, a people started telling me I should design wallpaper but having been a you know a photographer forever I, I didn't never really consider it a second career but then my um, I, I became kind of a closeted wallpaper designer for five or six years and then opened my company in 2016 and um, still wasn't really taking it seriously. And then uh, Cooper Hewitt um, took one of my designs into the permanent collection and that kind of put me on the map and on a road to, um, to making wallpaper and having a, a, a real company. So um, I'm gonna be very quick about my paper. Uh, I had a very, uh, one of my 450,000 phone calls I had or emails I had with Lucian. Um, during the process of, of the renovation, uh, we talked about designing something special for this area uh, going from the lobby into the grill room. And so I was trying to come up with something. A lot of my wallpapers have an organic element to them. They're all based on photographs. So I wanted to do something that kind of took the incredible design of, of what Lucian and Steven did, but also since this club is all about the golf course, take one of the elements of the golf course and one of the main elements of the golf course are the date palms. So I photographed date palms and, and knowing that Lucian was a huge Fornicetti fan, I tried kind of used what they did as inspiration and did lines of uh, date palms as stripes on the wall. So, um, you know, from a distance, you know, you know, maybe you can tell they're date palms. Some people say you can't. Um, other people see other things in there, which I won't mention. Um, but uh, but this is what we came up with, um, and and you know, uh, working with Lucian to to figure out the colors to make it work uh, with everything else that was going on, and and then you know what an honor it is to have John's uh, John Devola's dogs uh, to be the backdrop for John Devola's dogs over here, which you'll see when you walk through. So um, that's it for me. And uh, I'm going to pass back to Brooke. Dan, it is uh, a real treat to see you here. And uh, I just want to um, tell anyone in this room that doesn't know about the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours that Dan personally uh, spent uh, not only working on the photographs, which um, he set up a production line in the conference room, and uh, t uh, mastered each individual image that you see on the walls, but also was the de facto uh, construction superintendent day after day throughout this entire uh, project. This would have never gotten done uh, on time, and it would have never gotten done to the quality of construction that uh, we have today if it wasn't for Don's efforts. So thank you very much.
So you walked, if you walked through this reception area, you walked past one of John Tavola's works. It's a, a diptych, two photographs, but it is one work. And, um, and then there's another work here, which you may have seen earlier in the season. It was in the private dining room. We moved it out here so it could be enjoyed by more people on every day. John Devola is a renowned photographer who lives and works in Riverside, California. His career spans four decades and focuses on the conceptions and limitations of photography. Devola received his MFA from UCLA, and he's a tenured professor in the art department at UC Riverside. John's work was included twice in the Whitney Biennial. How many of you have been to the Whitney Biennial in New York? A good, good number. Well, John was invited to the Whitney Biennial twice, but how many times did he go? Once. The answer is once. Why did he only go once? Because the first time he was invited, he was so new as an artist, he didn't really know, he told me this, he didn't really know what the Whitney Biennial was or how important it was, so he just sent the photographs, and, um, and he, uh, he didn't go. But then the good news was the Whitney bought the photographs, and so, or some of the photographs, and so John was invited back again in 2017, 1981, 2017. Um, that's a, qu quite an accomplishment. John has had numerous solo and group exhibitions nationally and internationally. His work is in the collections of numerous museums, including MoMA in New York, the Art Institute of Chicago, Seattle Art Museum, Center Pompidou, and Palm Springs Art Museum, as well as in many private collections around the world, including here in the desert. John? Thank you. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been in a country club before, so this is an exotic uh, engagement for me. Uh, thanks to uh, Susan and Rod and Brooke for including me. Um, as was uh, stated, I'm a photographer, so what I do, the, you know, the, uh, the primary action takes place in a fraction of a second, essentially. So uh, since I'm old and I've been around a long time, <clears throat> and done a lot of work. I've done a lot of different kinds of work. Uh, and the, the one thing that I think is maybe a, a through line, and it's true for most photographers, is that I see the photograph is, is a, is an artifact of a kind of engagement in the world. So you move into the world and you make these things, and somehow uh, the, the artwork is an index of your kind of engagement in the world. Uh, and I've done a, a number of series out in the desert, not in Palm Springs specifically, but mostly Joshua Tree, 29 Palms. <clears throat> One body of work I did in the mid-90s was... One body of work? Uh, One body of work I did in the mid-90s was Isolated Houses in the Desert, uh, which were color photographs. Uh, and when I was out making those photographs, dogs would chase my car. So once I sort of came to a point of diminishing returns with that body of work, I started bringing a motor drive uh, camera out with a really grainy black and white film and would photograph dogs chasing my car. So uh, that's what's here. Uh, this one is actually uh, a whole roll of film, just 36 exposures with a motor drive, one hand on the steering wheel, one hand out the window, and, uh, and shooting the dogs chasing my car. So uh, that is about the extent of my comments, and I'd be happy to uh, entertain any questions. No, no. As Did I the wrote, dogs ever catch Jen? No. Uh, the dogs never caught me. And, and I, there's a book of these. Uh, and in the preface I wrote that uh, I think the last line was that, that a dog will never catch a, a car and a, a photographer will never capture reality. So it's evidence of dedication to a hopeless enterprise in both cases. Yeah. yeah. Marilyn's asking if John has a show pending in New York. That's like an underhand pitch, right? Uh, Yes, uh, I, uh, uh, Yancey Richardson Gallery in April. Thank you very much. Yeah. April 16th. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm really happy to introduce you tonight to Jim Isserman. Jim's art practice encom encompasses a variety of mediums, including painting, drawing, sculpture, site-specific installations, and graphic and product design. Pattern, color, geometry, and repetition are the cornerstones and generators of his work. 
which is anchored by the core principles of structural logic, precision, and integrity, and ignited by areas of texture, complexity, and blasts of brilliant color. Jim has shown his work in group and solo shows internationally, and it is included in the United States and international museum and private collections, including Palm Springs Art Museum, MoMA, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, LA County Museum of Art, MOCA in LA, the Art Institute of Chicago, just to name a few. These paintings here were featured in Copy, Pattern, Repeat, which was Jim's 2020 solo exhibition at Palm Springs Art Museum in the Architecture and Design Center. And sadly, the show was only open for a short time before the museum had to close its doors due to the pandemic. But if you drove by, you might have seen the beautiful pattern that Jim designed for the exhibition that we installed on all the exterior windows of the Architecture and Design building. And you might have also seen people wearing that pattern around town because Jim collaborated with Trina Turk to use that pattern on a number of pieces of menswear from the Mr. Turk line. Jim is based in Palm Springs. He also teaches at UC Riverside. And um, he lives in a fabulous Donald Wexler and Richard Harrison designed steel house in North Palm Springs. So I'm going to hand the microphone over to Jim. Thank you, Jim. Um, thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Don Flood, for everything you did as well. Um, I'm one of the people who moved out here in 1997 to get away from the art world, and it seems to have followed me here. Um, I'm very happy to have these paintings seen because, as Brooke said, they were originally made for the exhibition that was at the Palm Springs Architecture and Design Center. And it, these are two of 12 paintings that describe stripes of odd numbers or even numbers around a transparent cube, which is in what is known as axonometric perspective. And I had c conceived this body of work before Brooke and I started talking about the show, and if you've been to the ADC, you know it's a glass box. So it seemed like the perfect site for these works. And the 12 paintings were the you know, finite number of, of works that would describe these stripes moving around this box. And they were to be exhibited, at, well, they were exhibited in 2020. They were supposed to be open to the public the entire year. And it was funny because earlier, uh, in December of 19, they asked me to do a talk in the, Arch in the Alexander Gerard exhibition and talk about his use of color, which I hadn't thought a lot about until I started looking at it and realizing something that was similar to the way I work in terms of choosing well-known groups of patterns, like or colors like red, white, and blue, or black and white, or working with um, you know, like colors. And so over, it's interesting, over the course of my career, I've done a lot of red, white, and blue paintings. And I knew that these paintings would be up through the election in 2020. And I like to think about them as alternative flags, depending on how the election turned out. Um, didn't really end up needing them, but it was a happy exercise to go through. So happy to answer any questions. And I think in the lobby, I noticed there's two copies of this a uh, monograph I produced over the pandemic. I worked with Radius Books to produce a 350-page tombstone, um, which encapsulates the last 42 years of my career. So um, I'll end it there, and happy to ask any questions now or when, when we get to the Q&A. Okay, for those of you who have been to the art museum, and I'm sure everybody in this room has, I'm talking about the, the, the big build, you know, the bigger building, not the art, architecture and design. As you enter and you walk toward the back, and there are staircases going up to the top floor, there is a very large, fabulous piece, yellow is the best way to describe it, which is a permanent installation in the Palm Springs Art Museum. So I just thought I would mention that since the people here live in Palm Springs or live in the immediate area.
neither of the artists could be here tonight, but they wanted to thank everybody for the opportunity to show their work here. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions I can about their work. So I'm gonna start with Andrea Zettel. She's the artist of these two watercolors. We brought them out from the private dining room so that everybody could see them more easily here. And also the two billboards that are on either end of the main dining room down here. Andrea is originally from Escondido, California, and she lived in California until 1988 when she moved to the East Coast to go to graduate school at the Rhode Island School of Design. And I should say we have another Rhode Island School of Design graduate here tonight, Philip K. Smith. Um, so Andrea then, after she graduated from RISD, she moved to New York City where she really established her art practice. And she also worked as a gallery attendant or um, sort of receptionist at a number of galleries. And that's when she started doing a series of work that involved the clothes that she wore every day. Because when she started working in galleries, she thought, what am I gonna wear? I don't have a trust fund. I, I, I can't afford to go shopping at parties and, and get dresses to wear to work every day. So I'm just gonna make a uniform. And so she made uniforms for herself for every season of the year. And she would make new ones every fall, every spring, every winter, every summer. And gradually she amassed a whole collection of these uniforms. And she still follows that practice today. And one of the most, or sort of probably the most important thing about Andrea's work is that her entire practice is about investigating daily life. And she uses herself as the guinea pig for that. And she moved out to Joshua Tree in 2000 and she acquired some land, and she started um, building what is now a compound called AZ West, her initials, um, that includes now a house that she completely renovated, um, guest cabins, some permanent outdoor installations, a weaving studio, and her art studio. She recently bought uh, another house in Joshua Tree, which she's almost finished, um, transforming, and she has handed over the stewardship of A to Z West to High Desert Test Sites, which I believe Margot mentioned right at the beginning of this evening. High Desert Test Sites is a nonprofit organization that Andrea co-founded in 2002 as a platform to support artists and their investigations into showing putting, as she said it, putting art out into the world. And so every year, High Desert, every other year, High Desert Test Sites would stage an exhibition of work by artists in and around Joshua Tree up in the High Desert. And the next one is coming up, opening on April 9th and 10th that weekend. And it's gonna be an amazing exhibition of a lot of internationally known artists who have spent now more years than they expected to, learning about the high desert and identifying sites and creating work to place there. So we hope that you'll all be able to go up to the high desert and visit high desert test sites. And at that time, it will also be possible to visit A to Z West and see Andrea's house and the other um, buildings and artworks at, at that compound. So the work that we have here at Tamarisk includes two billboards, and she calls them her billboard projects because they're painted on four by eight sheets of plywood and using a vocabulary that recalls signage or graphic design, and also includes um, herself sort of, you know, obscured in some ways in each of the billboards that we have here. So in this one, you can see there's a figure almost holding a structure, geometric, sort of almost like a floor plan. I like to think that it recalls a floor plan um, against a desert landscape. And then the other billboard at the other end of the room is the same figure wearing, she always wears Birkenstocks, um, sort of leaning over and touching 
another um, sort of structure or floor plan. And those shapes reappear in these watercolors, which were done uh, more recently. And she used planar shapes that she derived from signage, from print design, from other sources. And she overlaid them against loosely painted watercolor landscapes. And she really did a lot of these watercolors. And there are, are a few more in the private dining room as studies for an installation at A to Z West called Planar Pavilions, which is a sculptural installation of a number of open air, kind of loosely defined pavilions on her property. And she created that installation because when she was living up there and working every day in her studio, people would always try to come up there and drive up the dirt road and try to visit. And she wanted to have something that people could visit without having to make an appointment. And so the planar pavilions are kind of at the base of her property, closer to Highway 62, the 29 Palms Highway. And they're accessible to anybody um, without an appointment. They can just drive up and experience them. And they're kind of the three-dimensional realization of a lot of the forms that you see in the watercolors and the billboards. Amy Kim Keeler is a full-time obstetrics nurse at Eisenhower Hospital. And she also does a kind of visiting nurse sojourns every now and then to places that don't have obstetrics nurses on their staff. And so she spends time in Hemet and other areas where the hospitals are smaller. She is sorry she couldn't be here tonight. She is one of the artists that I didn't know about until I started working on this program and thinking about other artists that we can include. She was born in LA and she now lives in Yucca Valley up in the high desert. And she started making art about five or six years ago. She initially had, she was living in the Bay Area before she moved to the high desert and she had the idea of starting a kind of clothing line where she would make scrubs for medical staff that weren't ugly. And she bought tons of fabric and she tried to figure out how to start this business off. And eventually she just decided that wasn't really what she wanted to do. But she was interested in working with fiber. And so she started making art about five or six years ago. And she noticed because she was um, seeing how many online deliveries everybody was getting from UPS, from Amazon, et cetera, and how many cardboard boxes were just being you know, tossed away. And so she decided that she would use corrugated cardboard as her canvas. And she says she developed an intimate relationship with corrugated cardboard. And so she initially used recycled cardboard from all these boxes that were just gonna be thrown away and um, thread or fiber. And so she uses the thread as paint and the cardboard as her canvas. And she's, um, she likes to use the cardboard because it has this structure to it and it has a certain rigidity and it also has a grid. And you'll see in her works that she works, she creates landscapes that have more curves to them, but she also creates more, some of these pieces that are more geometric in nature. And she works in different sizes, but she is kind of, the sizes are determined by the sizes of cardboard that she uses. And I also haven't asked her this, but I wondered if she worked a lot with small pieces of cardboard because she could bring them with her when she went to work. And if she was waiting for a delivery to happen, maybe she could make a few stitches while she was at the hospital all night. Um, so she's inspired by forms found in nature, sound and light waves, striations and rock formations, clouds, landscape forms, and you'll see all of those as you look at her work. There are two pieces, as I mentioned, in the bar, and also the piece in the foyer near the wallpaper that Dawn Flood designed. Um, she is also inspired by artists, including Sheila Hicks, who is an amazing, great, revered weaver, um, Irving Harper, who did more kind of illustrative work, but she finds inspiration in all those kinds of work. And so we're really excited to be able to include Amy here. She was a new artist 
for me and Rod and Susan, and we're really happy to discover her work and to be able to introduce it to you here. So thank you everybody for coming tonight. Thank you to the terrific staff, to the board, to all of you for being here, and to our artists. Thank you. Have a nice dinner. <laughs>